All right, thanks everyone for having me. Um, I want to, uh, uh, first of all, I want to I establish a couple of things here. I got three goals with this presentation. One is I want to give you something new to think about, a new way to solve an old problem. Uh, two, I want to maybe make you laugh for a second. Um, and then three, I want to keep our, our cameraman busy because I told him, I, I told some of our hosts that I was going to keep him busy as I uh, roam around the stage. I can't stand still while I talk. Um, but thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to jump in front of you. I will not make this a commercial about my company, uh, but I will uh, help you understand some new ideas and new things about uh, threats and how to handle them. Okay? So let's get in. Let's get at it. Let's talk about threats. We know about the insider and the outsider, right? Lions and tigers and bears, right? They're everywhere. They're, the, the outsider, we, we, we're very familiar with the outside threat. Nation states, uh, attackers, organized attackers, even script kiddies, right? You got, you got individual lone wolves out there writing scripts against your websites and your internet presence trying to figure out, did you reset your root password? Have you changed the administrator password? Let's see if we can guess our way in and brute force attack something that you might have exposed out there. But what about these insiders? Who are these guys, right? Well, an easy way to think about it is really it's everybody that works for your organization. It's people who have access to things that they shouldn't have access to or they don't need access to because of their job. Well, why do they have access to those things? Well, they have access to those things because of inadequacies associated with the technologies that are used to protect those things and the people that are managing those things. Right? That's why they have access to them. I can't define what it is that these people should have access to, so I just open it up and rely on logins and passwords to protect me. Right? Bad idea. <clears throat> so what is a malicious insider? Gartner in May of 2016 had a quote out there that basically said, anyone that is deliberate in their theft, misuse, or destruction of company property. Okay? These are known, trusted people. They've got badges on their hips or around their necks. You see them in and out of the office every day. They know their way around the building. And for whatever reason, either knowingly or unknowingly, they're suddenly presented as a threat in your organization. They're given access to something they don't otherwise need access to. Uh, they have access to something on the network that they shouldn't have access to. Um, and there's a lot of arguments. Are these really real? Read the, read the end of the, uh, the quote there. Uh, a lot of people brush off the insider as an urban myth, an urban legend. Uh, yeah, people say they're a, they're a problem, but we've never been attacked by an insider. Oh, really? How did that data get leaked? You know, how did that person find their way in? Social engineering is, is one way to get into an environment, and it takes an insider to be social engineered for that external person to be able to get in. So there's all kinds of uh, data that's out there. Various sources have all kinds of different percentages about how real this insider threat problem really is. Uh, regardless of which source you believe, I think you could probably reach the conclusion that the threat is real. It is uh, a common problem. Uh, people having too much access, people having access to things they shouldn't have access to, and people just not knowingly doing things that are inappropriate with data and systems uh, on the network. Why is it that our networks and our applications are vulnerable? Why, why are we in this position? If we were to rewind the clock to 1996 or sometime around there and take a server administrator and a network administrator and stick them in a cave, like Rumpelstiltskin them, right? Stick them in a cave and don't let them out until today. What do you think their reaction would be? Well, I can tell you that the server administrator would come out of the cave and he would say, Cloud? What's that? Amazon? They sell books, don't they? VMware? Hypervisor? I've never heard of this stuff. My IT world is completely different. By the way, they've never heard of iPhones or Linux either, right? But the network security guy comes out of the cave and he looks around and he's like, huh, VPN, router, 
Firewall. Nat. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Who wants to give me a job? Right? My technology, my world hasn't changed. Oh, token ring is missing. Where's token ring? Where did it go? Right? That, that changed. But who cares? Everything's built on TCPIP based Ethernet networks now. We all still use routers and firewalls and VPNs to protect access to these things. Remember the keynote this morning? We're still using those technologies to build moats around our castles. And it doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because our end users have changed and the computing models that they demand and use every day have changed. We have more computing power in this room right now than almost any data center on the planet had in the entire building back in 1996. With your laptops and your iPhones and your iPads and multiple iPhones and blah, 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 right? We have more computing power right here than, than, than's ever been available to us to use. And because of that, combined with the fact that Wi-Fi networks are ubiquitous now, in fact, prior to me jumping up here, I actually did two WebExes by sitting over next door to the other building and jumping on the uh, hospital's guest Wi-Fi and did presentation, shared my screen, did my thing, I did my job from some random location, which I'm sure we're all in here doing today as well, right? We're in some random location doing our job, accessing our systems. Uh, us, we, the, the user population of the world, have changed. We have the ability to connect from anywhere and do our jobs from anywhere on any network, on literally with almost any device. Um, and yet, the way that we protect access to those applications and those systems hasn't changed. We're still using VPNs. We're still using firewalls. I don't know if you know this, but firewall rules are based on five basic pieces of data. One of those is source IP. How in the world does your firewall administrator know that your source IP is gonna be the IP address of this Wi-Fi today? They don't. They have no clue. So they have no choice but to make you either connect in some unsatisfactory, complicated VPN kind of way, or open that firewall rule up so that you can access it from anywhere. Okay? Either way is a bad answer. That's what's happening. This is the part where you're supposed to laugh. VPNs aren't working. They're a broken 25 year old piece of technology and they have to go away. They force users to connect to one place. That place is an open port on the internet that's always listening, doesn't know who's connecting to it until after the authentication happens, which means it's open and susceptible to bad guys breaking it. Ask Cisco, they had an emergency patch in May of last year that had to be rolled out to every single Cisco AnyConnect VPN concentrator on the planet because they could be compromised and taken over. And every other VPN on the planet works the same way. Open port, usually port 443, listening all the time, waiting for people to connect, whether you're a good guy or a bad guy. And that, my friends, is a fundamental flaw in TCP IP. We will talk about that later. Another issue with VPNs, typically, they have to be combined with other technologies in order to really make them secure. Just because the technology is encrypting the traffic between the end user and the concentrator doesn't mean that it's a security tool. All it is is a connectivity tool. Once it gets past the concentrator, the VPN does nothing to make sure that that user has access to specific things and not everything. You have to use other technologies like ACL rules, other firewalls, other hoops that the user has to jump through in order to lock that user down on that backend network. And by the way, if you've got more than one data center, now you've just complicated the network connectivity by the number of data centers that you have and throw cloud environments in there too. Right? If you've got three data centers in one cloud environment, now you've got four things you've got to think about. How are you going to get your users to connect to those four things? Well, you've got two choices. You can either make the VPN into one place and connect them to all the other places on the back end, or you can teach the user, this app lives in place one, this other app lives in place two, and this other app lives in place three. 
you need app one, go to VPN concentrator one. If you need app two, go to VPN concentrator number two, right? That doesn't work. You're not gonna teach your users how to do that. So you're left giving this open-ended back-end connectivity between the various data centers. By the way, you can't predict what that traffic's gonna look like. You have no idea where those users are gonna go, what time they're gonna do it, where, where they're gonna end up uh, coming from or going to. So you almost always open up the connectivity so that anybody on network A can get to anything on network B. And again, it's limitations in TCP IP and how we define these rules. Gartner has a pretty bold prediction that's even more bold than mine. By 2021, 60% of you will be eliminating your VPNs. That's just next year. They made this prediction in 2016, if I remember right. There's a Gartner document on the internet that has cesspool in the title where that quote came from. You can go Google it and find it. Cesspool, C-E-S-S-P-O-O-L. What else isn't working? Firewalls aren't working. What's wrong with firewalls, Jim? Firewalls again, 25-year-old technology. They've gotten better. There is a next-gen firewall, and next-gen firewalls do some interesting things. But at the end of the day, they are static in the way that they're configured. They're complicated in a lot of ways. When we implement a firewall, we tend to have baseline rules built into that firewall. I'm gonna allow certain things in, let them through, I'm gonna block everything else. And over time, the longer that firewall exists, the more exceptions you have to make to it. Hey, we got Jerry, the new CEO, he wants to be able to connect from home just like the corporate office, so let's make some Jerry rules in the firewall. We know Jerry's source IP on his home network, so we can connect him in and we'll make some exception rules for him. Two years later, Jerry gets fired or Jerry quits and goes to another job and then we hire Maria to come in as the new CEO and Jerry's rules stayed in the firewall because two years later nobody remembered why those rules were added to the firewall and they're afraid to take them out because they might break something that they don't know of. So there's a hole that's permanently in your firewall for whatever reason, right? It's exploitable. Uh, and, it, it, and it goes on from there. That's just a silly example, but that's a, a, it goes on from there. Um, Firewalls also are sort of, they're sort of monolithic independent entities, right? You deploy a firewall in your data center and all of a sudden I've got another data center and now I've got another firewall and how do I, do I make sure that they have the same rules or do they have different rules? And if they need to have the same rules because I've got an app that lives in both, how do I make sure that those rules are managed and maintained together? How do I roll policy out to them collectively, right? Should I be able to do that or can I not do that? These are things that you've got to think about. They're difficult to manage, and it takes teams of people to do it. Uh, I've been to some organizations that have 30, 40, 50 individuals responsible for just making firewall changes. Go through the change management process, it has to be approved, you put it in dev, test it, make sure it works, put it into production, you got back out plans and all that other stuff, and don't even start me with, well, what happens when I gotta make firewall changes on the cloud versus at home in my corporate data center? There's different rule sets for those as well, right? So it's a, it's a mess. Here's the third one, laughter, laughter. NACs aren't working either, right? Uh, I often go into accounts where NACs have been deployed and they're like, look, we didn't realize that we had to buy all Cisco gear from this day forward. So every company we acquire, part of the acquisition cost is to go and rip out all the old network gear from that other vendor and in install Cisco gear. I didn't want that when I bought the NAC. Uh, and, and by the way, the NAC, the NAC is interesting, right? It helps me micro-segment that back-end network. Well, just about every implementation I've ever talked to, and you know, you might inside your own head nod yes or no or whatever, but just about everyone I've ever talked to, I ask them, at the end of the day, when you got done implementing the NAC, did you dump down the rules on the micro-segmentation because you figured out it was gonna be a nightmare to manage into the future? And the answer is always, yeah, we pretty much did. NACs are also interesting for managing the LAN, right? The local area network. I wanna be able to know when something gets plugged into the LAN or when something connects to the Wi-Fi, I wanna profile that device and understand what it is and map that user or that device and the user that's using that device to certain applications that are on the backside. I want to be able to do that. That's great. That's a, that's a great goal to have. New devices are coming out all the time. 
How's that going to work when the device isn't actually on the LAN? When somebody off the LAN wants to connect to the network and use one of those applications? Now what are you going to do? Well, you can force them to use a VPN tunnel and get back on the LAN, right? So now we're back to why the VPNs don't work. So again, the bottom line is these three technologies have some common weaknesses. First of all, they are connect first, authenticate later technologies. They assume that if you're on the network, they should respond to the user using the computer and then force the user to authenticate. There's an assumption that you're a good guy at that point. They are static. There's hardly any dynamic concepts built into any of these technologies. There's nothing that dynamically changes as your backend world changes or as your user population changes. Very static in nature, uh, very manually configured. Users are not IP addresses. All of these technologies are configured based on IP addresses. I need to know source IPs, destination IPs, protocols are involved. Nowhere in there does it say, Jerry, the CEO, when working from home on a corporate issued device that's running an antivirus with an encrypted hard drive, nowhere, no, those policies don't exist in these technologies, right? Oh, I didn't finish. I would say also, obviously, the perimeter has changed. We talked about that in terms of the guys in the cave um, and our ability to work from anywhere. Uh, another interesting concept, IoT, right? Internet of Things. We've talked about it already today in some of the previous sessions. Uh, things trying to access your data and your applications are not always people. They're not always laptops and they're not always iPhones and iPads. There's other things pumping data in or requesting data out. Uh, to be used. So IoT devices is something that needs to be taken into account here as well. And finally, the bad guys are not always on the outside, right? With all of these issues with this older technology, it's no wonder that people, whether purposefully malicious or not, uh, they trip themselves up and they expose things and they let things out of the environment because they had access to it in the first place. So we need a new approach, right? Do we agree? All right. What if we could wave our magic wand, conjure up something new that would be interesting and take care of a lot of these issues that we're exposing here? We would need something that works today. It needs to work right now on our existing infrastructure, needs to work with the cloud, needs to work with our mainframes, our VAXs, our IoT devices. It needs to work with all the technology that we already have invested in, right? It's an important concept needs to work on a TCP IP based network, right? Because we're all running a TCP IP based network these days. It needs to run on that. It needs to work everywhere. I have physical, you have physical data centers, you have cloud environments, you have Azure, you have Google, you have AWS, uh, you have others, you have private cloud, public cloud, you have SaaS applications, uh, you have co-location, you have all kinds of different environments that you need this to work in, right? You shouldn't have different security platforms for your different environments. Uh, be because they're architected different. They all run on a TCP IP based network. Why can't we use that as the foundational level? And then finally, it needs to work on anything. It needs to work on PCs and mobile devices. It needs to work on your developers using their Linux laptops. It needs to work on that. It needs to work on uh, IoT devices. I need to be able to understand the profile of the traffic coming out of an IoT device and control where it's actually able to write data to or what it's actually able to read from, right? So it, this conjuring needs to support all these concepts. Forrester has uh, created something that they call Zero Trust. Uh, it's, it's a series of concepts built around uh, a whole bunch of different capabilities and uh, use cases, but the, the basic premise behind Zero Trust is that uh, people and things should not be inherently trusted just because they're connecting from a known location. And from there, you go deeper. Uh, the things that though, the traffic that those things are actually generating should always be encrypted, right? So that's another concept. It should always be logged. It should work the same way on every platform. Blah blah blah. There's more details about it. You can look up the uh, Forrester Zero Trust Extended Wave. Uh, that came out in December. That's a very detailed document. It's about 65 pages long, I think. That talks about all these various capabilities and a lot of the vendors that play in the space. Right? It's a real thing.
But at, at the root of it, what Zero Trust really says is that access should be identity centric. You should know who the people are that are accessing or that you should know what the devices are if there's not a person at the end of the device uh, that are accessing the applications and the data. You should know that before you grant them access to it. It also uh, it incorporates the idea of live entitlements. You should be able to define destinations based on metadata, not just IP addresses or DNS names. I'm gonna fall off the stage. <laughs> um, you should be able to use metadata. I wanna be able to define a destination based on a role or a project or a group or a tag or something like that instead of an IP address. At the end of the day, we have to use IP addresses because that's the way the network works but I want to define my policies based on this metadata, right? And then finally, it should also incorporate micro-segmentation. I want, I want to make sure that if something on my network gets compromised, that that compromised thing isn't able to compromise other things that are on the same network, right? I want to be able to control that, isolate it, right? We all know that we don't live in a perfect world. It's a matter of time before I fall off the stage and break my leg. It's a matter of time before you know, this thing that we have perfectly isolated and perfectly deployed is eventually going to get compromised, right? We have to go through life thinking that. It's going to happen someday. We don't want it to happen, and we'll do everything we can, we can to prevent it from happening. But if it does happen, we don't want it to affect other things, right? And that's the, the real concept behind micro-segmentation. The great news is that there is a uh, concept out there called software-defined perimeter. Do you remember the hype cycle from this morning? They're on one of the hype cycles. Great, that, that's why I feel like I have a cold because I've been dealing with the hype cycle at RSA for the last week. Um, Software-defined perimeter was over the crest and headed toward the valley of disappointment or whatever it's called. So we're headed downhill with software-defined perimeter. Uh, it's, the word is getting out about what it does and how it does it, and which means rapid adoption is soon to follow. And there are a lot of customers that have actually adopted it. There's actually a lot of players in the space. Um, Cisco's made some acquisitions recently. Uh, Symantec's made some acquisitions recently. Uh, all kinds of them are out there. But three fundamental things about software-defined perimeter. First of all, let's bring the user back into the security equation. Let's break the TCP IP fundamental flaw. And let's make sure that we collect the credentials from the user, build trust with that user's device and the network that it's connected to before we let that user access any application in the network, right? That's the, that's the first thing. So bring the user back in to the security equation. Second, let's implement a zero trust model. Let's encrypt all the traffic. It doesn't matter if it's an HTTPS, it doesn't matter if it's FTP, it doesn't matter if it's an SSH session, it doesn't matter if it's an ODBC connection to a database somewhere. Let's encrypt it all. All, all the time, okay? So let's encrypt it. Let's also not trust anybody because they're connecting from a specific spot, say the corporate office. Just because they're on the corporate land doesn't mean that they should necessarily be inherently trusted. Let's, let's make them prove that we should trust them. Let's make sure that they're running the antivirus that we said they should be running. Let's make sure they're meeting all the BYOD policies that we've documented. Let's make sure that their local firewall is enabled. Let's make sure that their hard drive is encrypted. And if it isn't, then you don't qualify to use the PC on the network and reach any critical data on that system, right? So let's block them if it doesn't meet, meet all that information. And then finally, under number two, let's implement the principle of least privilege. Ever heard of that? That is, in network nomenclature, the ability to reach the apps and only the apps that you need to do your job. Let's make sure that you can get, if you're the customer service rep, then you get to the customer service app and not the finance system. You got no business on the finance system. So you shouldn't even find it on the network. Even if it's sitting on the next IP address from the customer service app, you shouldn't be able to see it on the network. Principle of least privilege. And then finally, let's make sure, our software defined perimeter make sure that the solution works on every platform, every hypervisor, every data center, every cloud infrastructure as a service works the same way everywhere can be deployed programmatically, can de be deployed manually, uh, and can be scaled programmatically as well and managed from a single pane of glass. That's what software defined perimeter entails. Uh, Gartner has some great things to say about it. Uh, I would suggest 
In December of last year, Gartner released their CARTA document, which was also discussed earlier today. Uh, go find that document. If you have access to Gartner Docs, uh, it's, a, it's a good read, it's worth a read. And you can understand uh, Gartner's perspective. Now, obviously, this is Gartner's attempt to glomming onto the zero trust thing that Forrester came up with, right? Gartner and Forrester compete with each other. So the Forrester document, the zero trust extended uh, wave document is another good document to get your hands on and read about. One thing about that CARTA document Gartner recommends that's a quote that I love because of the company I work for. Gartner suggests that every organization have two projects in 2019 to evaluate uh, their CARTA concepts. One is a software-defined perimeter uh, implementation for some use case, and another is a micro-segmentation project. So it's right there in the document. Go, go check it out. Uh, Google, you guys have heard of Google, right? Of course. They have a, uh, a system that they developed internally called BeyondCorp. Uh, maybe you've heard of that. So what BeyondCorp is, Google basically woke up about six years ago and looked around and said, we're done with all these old-fashioned firewalls and VPNs and routers and all that stuff. We're done with it. We're going to treat every user like they're the outsider, like they're the, of the public, and even if they're an employee, and we're going to implement a solution that allows uh, that user to connect only to the resources that they should see based on their job, and uh, they're going to they're going to get in after they authenticate. Then we'll grant them access to the particular apps. And if they don't meet our needs, if they if they don't meet the BYOD policies and the other things that are required before that connection is made, then we're not going to let them connect. Gee, it smells like software-defined perimeter to me. And that's exactly uh, so. So Google basically led the way with their own private deployment of Beyond Corp and helping to get that kick started. Well, that led to the Cloud Security Alliance climbing on to the idea and creating the software-defined perimeter specification. The SDP spec uh, is uh, in 2.0 now. It's been augmented after the first release, and it includes a lot of interesting things. Uh, one of the most important and unique factors that really makes it different from all the other technologies is not only this idea of authenticate first, connect second, but also the implementation of port knocking. What port knocking is is the idea that I have a port that's listening on the internet, but I'm actually not going to listen until I get the right knock. And if I get the right knock, then I'll open the port up and I'll listen, right? It's also called single packet authorization. So I, imagine me giving you a key, right? You have the key as a user, and you want to connect to something, you have to use the key to expose that something. And then that something will listen to you and take your credentials and, and understand who you are. So it's, it's, a, it's port knocking or single packet authorization that's part of that specification. Here's the thing that I've been harping on, right? So how does this actually work? We solved this fundamental flaw with TCP IP. And the flaw is, you know, the idea that you uh, can pull up your phone or your tablet or whatever and connect to, uh, you know, my company's portal.mycompany.com, uh, that exposes the flaw and you get the login page, right? So you can connect to that or I can connect to it and it doesn't matter, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a, uh, a VPN concentrator and you're, and you're pointing your VPN client to it. It doesn't matter if it's a, uh, a gateway to a Citrix jump host. All of this stuff is exposed on the internet and anybody can connect to it because of that open listening port. What, what Software Defined Perimeter does is actually locks that down, closes it up, and makes it so that it doesn't listen unless it gets that single packet authorization key as the first part of the communication string. If it gets the right key, it'll open the port and listen to the communication and say, all right, you got the right key, you must be somebody that I should at least pay attention to, now what do you want to tell me? Right, and that's when you give credentials and you start to authenticate yourself. At the end of the day, if you implement Software Defined Perimeter and Zero Trust, here's some things that you should be able to achieve. First of all, it should work the same way across all of your environments. It's, it's cloud native and hybridly deployed, okay? So the same security model can be used in the corporate office, in the corporate data center, in your third party colo, as in Amazon and in Azure. The same security model across all those platforms. Imagine that, right? You don't have to have a cloud security team 
and a data center security team as two separate teams because they're dealing with two separate technologies, right? If you stay on these old fashioned tools, that's exactly what you're running into. But if you move to something that's new and fresh, uh, this, is what you, this is what you end up with. You'll also end up with something that's highly resilient, massively scalable, programmatically scalable. Imagine a trigger getting fired when, when your gateway uh, goes over 75% utilization and just spin up another gateway. And it's automatically in use. User connections are starting to use it right away. Still flooded with traffic, spin up a third, spin up a fourth. No big deal, no license expansion, no HA license is required, no new boxes added to the environment, no deployment timelines, it's programmatic. Then the CPU utilization goes back down, knock one of them off so you're not paying for it anymore. So it's not utilizing your VMware resources or your cloud resources. Um, this obviously requires APIs to do this, right? Both inbound and outbound APIs. Integration is key to be able to make this kind of stuff work. It's a fully featured network security platform. The idea at the end of the day is that, you know, the right people get access to the right resources on the network, but only after they've identified themselves and authenticated to the environment and built trust with that authentication mechanism. And here's the quote from Gartner, by the way, the, the, about budgeting in 2019. Microsegmentation in a software-defined perimeter project. Lots of different implementations I can uh, refer back to, but a lot of companies will adopt software-defined perimeter for a number of reasons. Uh, the, easy, the easy home run adoption is VPN elimination. Uh, with software-defined perimeter, you can open multiple tools to multiple uh, data centers simultaneously, unlike with VPN where you've got one connection to one concentrator at a time. Uh, because of the way that it's implemented with plain English and metadata, you can eliminate 70% of your operational cost, whether that's people, time, energy, or technologies. It varies from company to company, but up to 70% elimination because of the simplicity in the way that it actually works. And you leverage existing investments. This technology can put multi-factor authentication in front of your mainframe. I'll repeat that. Multi-factor authentication in front of an application that doesn't support multi-factor. This technology can do that, okay? So there's no reason to go back and rebuild the mainframe app. There's no reason to go back and try to eliminate it right now. You can achieve multi-factor on day one, okay? Easy enough. Lots of different reasons, right? Lots of things you can expect. I'm not gonna read to you. Uh, VPNs, uh, reporting, because of the idea that, that the, the trust is being built with the end user every time they connect, and that trust includes things like your group memberships, your firewall uh, on your local PC, your hard drive encryption, all of that goes into the log. All of that goes into the log. So now you can answer the question to the auditors, who accessed the financial system on Friday night between five and seven, and what was the condition of their VPN uh, uh, software, what was the GPS coordinates of that PC, uh, did they have their local firewall enabled, and was their hard drive encrypted when they did it? Imagine answering that question with the tools you have at your disposal today. It would be very difficult. But with Software Defined Perimeter, you can answer it pretty easily. Uh, government agents, there's a, a government agency that reduced uh, FTEs managing access to systems from eight to one for 15,000 users. Okay, interesting use cases. So in summary, the insider threat is real. You are an insider. Everybody that works at your organization is an insider, and the threat is real. Uh, the perimeter is not unbreakable. It is easily breakable. Uh, walls don't work. That's my plug. Walls don't work. Um, you know, at least a, course, a quarter of all data breaches are due to some sort of insider threat, whether it's a an insider that's actually gone rogue, gone malicious, or it's somebody that didn't really know how to do what they were asked to do, or somebody got lazy and just didn't do it right, right? They're all the same result, it's a problem. So, today's solutions aren't working, firewalls, VPNs, and NACs. Uh, there's a place for some of those technologies. Uh, you know, you got a website, the general public needs access to it. Yeah, you need a firewall. And the firewall is not to protect the website, the firewall protects all the other things running in the DMZ that isn't the website, right, if you think about it. 
that firewall is, it's a straight path to the website, right? It's a hole. That's the way it works. You need a firewall for that. That's what the firewall is for. But a firewall is not a good thing for dynamic access, for remote end users that are part of your organization and telling them where they can go on the network. You need something that's more flexible. So Software Defined Perimeter does this. It is a uh, dynamic individual perimeter for each end user based on their role in the organization. Um, it has TTL concepts associated with it, so, those, so the, the perimeter is renewed periodically over time. It breaks the connection until trust is built, and it allows you to insert things like multi-factor before that connection is established. So we have a, a president of the federal group within our company has a nice quote flying around out there, complexity is the bane of security. And if you don't know Greg Tuhill, you should, somebody you should probably connect with on LinkedIn. But that's it. Thanks for listening.